presentation today is on the quantitation of the risk associated with fluoride exposures. Um, and it's a short version of a paper that was published in uh, December last year. Um, but that paper started out actually in 2012. It's been a long and crazy um, road to get it into print, but I won't go into that story right now. Um, the authors on the paper are, are as indicated, but it, two people uh, whose names aren't on there, who, whose contributions were absolutely essential for this thing to, to go forward is Chris Neubroth and, and Michael Connett. Uh, Chris, for his uh, amazing work with the mathematics on the benchmark dose, dose uh, risk analysis method, and Michael for his uh, encyclopedic <laughs> knowledge and collection of all the literature on uh, fluoride toxicity. Um, to tell you what I'm going to tell you, I'll tell you first the conclusions are that the current exposures uh, of, to fluoride put U.S. children at risk of loss of IQ. And we'll show you in the body of this presentation why that is. The economic impact at the individual and societal levels <coughs> cost of only a single IQ point uh, is significant, and losses of greater than one IQ point are possible. And the final conclusion, of course, is that exposure should be reduced. The EPA's, EPA is under a mandate <coughs> uh, from the Safe Drinking Water Act to protect uh, everyone, including sensitive subpopulations, uh, from any known or anticipated adverse effect on health with an adequate margin of safety. Uh, FAN's TOSCA Section 21 petition was filed last year, now the subject of a lawsuit about which we will hear from Michael tomorrow was aimed at establishing such a, an MCLG. Um, before we get into the details, uh, a brief lesson in uh, toxicology testing and risk analysis started out with some definitional stuff. The uh, lowest dose that, uh, in a test that causes an adverse effect is called the lowest observed adverse effect level, abbreviated LOAEL or LOAL. Um, and we want to find a dose that does not cause an adverse effect but which is as close to the low L as possible. That dose is called no observed adverse effect level, or no L. Uh, in order to, to establish uh, a safe dose, uncertainty factors are applied to a low L to arrive at a safe dose, um, going through the uh, derivation of the no L and then accounting for other, uh, other aspects. <clears throat> then if data exist to show a dose response effect, uh, another method called the benchmark dose method may be used in finding this safe dose or reference dose. Now here's an example. Uh, we have here uh, four uh, uh, exposed populations uh, putatively of, say, 10 animals exposed at uh, 50 milligrams per day, uh, 20 milligrams per day, 5 milligrams per day are the control uh, group that's exposed uh, at zero. Now, normally a dose is expressed in milligrams per kilogram per day, but for simplicity's sake, I'm just making it milligrams per day. And what we see from that table is that the animals dosed at the highest level, 50 milligrams a day, all of them show the toxic effect. The ones exposed at 20 milligrams, some half of them show the effect. At 5 milligrams, two showed the effect. <clears throat> and uh, the controls didn't show any effect. So, uh, Two or five milligrams um, per day is the lowest observed adverse effect level. Uh, we can't tell from, from these data what the safe dose might be that's higher than zero. <coughs> if there is such a dose, we can try, estimate, uh, try estimating it by using these uncertainty factors. We could use an uncertainty factor of 10 to extrapolate from the lowest observed adverse effect level to a possible no observed adverse effect level. But that's only one thing that needs to be considered. Uh, individuals have differing sensitivities, so we use them an uncertainty factor somewhere between 3 and 10 to account for that. And the effect could be generated also uh, in, in utero. And we could use another factor of 3 to 10 to account for that. There are other kinds of uncertainty factors depending on the particular risk analysis that's being conducted. But this is a standard method that uh, EPA uses. So if we used, for example, in this case, a, the uncertainty factors of 10, 3, and 3, we would derive a possible safe dose of 5 milligrams per day divided by 10 times 3 times 3, or 90, 
and the putatively safe dose would be something like 0.56 milligrams per day. Uh, given the fact that there is an apparent... Hello and welcome to another episode of your Human Service uh, News and Information Broadcast with Hassan Rashid. I'll be here with you for possibly 25 more minutes. It's excellent being here with you once again and it's such an awful great achievement to come in your lives like once again like we do here every day at CCTV. With that, I welcome you with the uh, ancient cordial of goodwill and that is peace be unto you. Okay, uh, I guess you're wondering now about uh, the opening video. Well, that was provided uh, through the courtesy of uh, FluoridaAlert.org and that was their latest uh, video on um, their, uh, their uh, platform for uh, uh, fresh, fresh water, fresh and clean drinking water, okay? So uh, they're uh, proponents of fresh and clean drinking water and uh, and that means that they want all of the uh, toxic, poisonous uh, elements that is employed uh, in the fresh water supply out of it. Like uh, now they've got the emphasis here on the poison fluoride. Fluoride is a poison, so they want it out of the water supply. We're going to try to get back to uh, fluoridealert.org, uh, their latest video with uh, Bill Hilsey. He was the, uh, I guess, the commentator on that. But uh, uh, I was I was I was looking. I I was attending uh, a fluoride uh, a freshwater clean water conference here in Cambridge, which was headed by a uh, city councilman, outgoing city councilman named Nazim Mazin, and he wants almost the same thing. He wants the poisonous chemicals taken out the freshwater supply, but he didn't get too far with that uh, here in Cambridge. But hopefully the incoming. Uh, uh, City Council Administration will uh, pursue that issue and try to clean up Cambridge's uh, fresh water supply. Take all the poison, toxinous, <laughs> toxic uh, chemicals out of the fresh water supply. We're going to get uh, back into that video. The gentleman will give you more detailed information on it than I can. So, uh, but once again, peace and welcome to another episode of the Human Service News and Information. I'd like to first, before we get into some of our, our subjects uh, for for for, uh, for this uh, for this episode, uh, I'd like to remind you that there are things going on here in Cambridge in December next month. There's a uh, there's a class at Field Camera 101 with uh, Gordon West. That's December 3rd, 6 to 9 p.m. There's also Audio 101 with Scotty Verkos, December 4, 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. There's Primetime Beginning Studio Production with the uh, Kevin Whitmore, that's December 5th, 6th, and 7th, from 6 to 9 p.m. Also, uh, there's uh, two new journalist classes uh, available, and I think there's still time to register for, for, for both of those classes. That's uh, what the first one is entitled Fake News Looking Critically at Modern Journalism with uh, Patricia E. Guess. It's uh, two Mondays, December 4th and 11th, 6 p.m. In this course, uh, they will uh, critically analyze media coverage of current happenings in our world. And the second course is uh, interviewing techniques with the Heather Avison. That's uh, one Wednesday, December 13th, 6 to 9 p.m. Learning how to balance the uh, key uh, keys to a great uh, interview, research, uh, research, curiosity, silence, and setup. So, okay, there's a <laughs> one more thing that I'll uh, inform you on that's happening here at CCTV in the near future. That's all about accessibility features on your. Uh, your computer device and web browser. That's uh, trouble seeing the, the small text on the screen of your computer or electronic device. Wish you could uh, assess certain computer applications without all the frustration. In this class, uh, they will divulge into uh, several of the available accessible features on your computer, electronic device, and internet browser to help you uh, navigate your way around the computer and the web with ease. So, to register for that, you can uh, contact uh, Michael Rodriguez at 617-401-4058 or by email, that's uh, email michael at cctvcambridge.org. That's Wednesday, December 13th, 2007, 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. Pre-requisite none, price is free. And if you seek extra help in learning how to use your electronic device or seek general computer help, please stop by uh, for our open labs. That's uh, open labs hours on Mondays or Thursdays, 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. No appointment necessary. So if you like uh, information on any of the courses uh, that I just briefly described, you can call 617, excuse me, 617-661-6900 or 617-401-4058 or you can come in and pick up uh, Open Studio. That's the uh, CCTV's 
uh, newsletter and uh, it's available for free and I'll tell you everything that's happening as far as course wise uh, for the month of uh, December okay uh, I got to like to remind you there's about two more days left in uh, National Native American Heritage Month that's uh, which was the whole of November was uh, proclaimed by the President Donald Trump as National Native American Month. So there's about two more days in that. Uh -huh. So uh, if you see the Native Americans around, go on and thank them and congratulate them and uh, help them in their celebration for these last two days of National Native American Heritage Month. Okay, um, all of the summer and fall farmers markets are closed except one. There's one farmers market that's open all year round and that's the uh, Child Square Farmers Markets for all you guys that uh, want to stock up on uh, fresh produce, etc. for the Christmas holiday and New Year's, that's the place to be. That's the uh, Charles uh, Square Farmers Market and they're open all year round, Friday 12 p.m. to 6 p.m., Sunday 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Charles Hotel Courtyard, 1 Bennett Street, so you can contact Boosa Farms 57 at gmail.com. That's open all year round. That's the uh, uh, Charles Square Farmers Market, okay? So, okay. Um, I'd like to inform you that there's only one federal agency dedicated to homelessness and it's at risk of extinction. The U.S. Inter, uh, uh, agency Council on Homelessness helps in veterans homelessness in some places and reduce overall homelessness. The White House and the uh, House correspondents want it gone, okay? So those folks in, the, in that uh, White House administration, they want uh, the uh, U.S. Inter agency Council on Homelessness uh, to end, okay? Last week, Atlanta ended uh, veterans in the Atlanta, Atlanta, the Georgia, ended veterans homelessness, placing nearly 1,900 people into permanent housing. The news would have attracted more media buzz if the three states and more than 40 communities had already claimed the same achievement in the last few years. Nationally, veteran homelessness has declined 47%. In seven years, overall homelessness also down 14%. Now the federal agency largely credited with making that historic process is at risk of losing all of its funding. When I was working on the staff, says Ralph Betcher, the former mayor of Salt, Salt Lake City, which was one of the first cities to end chronic homelessness, the federal role never got enough uh, acknowledgement. The fact of the matter is that the federal resources are what made the difference. This year, the both the White House and the U.S. Uh, House Appropriation Committee have called for eliminating the U.S. Uh, Interagency Council on Homelessness, an independent federal agency with 20 full-time employees and an annual budget of roughly $3.5 million. The U.S. Senate, though, has a com uh, competing proposal to fully fund the agency and remove a sunset provision that Congress has repeated, repeatedly extended in the past. With a federal budget, budget deadline of December 8th looming, it's not clear whether the council has a future or after uh, future after 2018. So if you want to do something about uh, extending or saving the life of the uh, U.S. Agency Council on Homelessness, uh, you can contact your elected officials and tell them that uh, you want uh, their budget restored, put back in place, and uh, not taken, uh, and not the uh, organization or the agency taken out of existence like the current uh, presidential administration wants to do. So you got to, I guess until December 8th to, uh, to make your move, that is to contact your elected officials, tell them that you want, you want to save this U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness, okay? So it's a very good organization and they help a lot of people. Okay, so I've got some information here for parents, okay? If, you're, if your family lives in any of the following situations, in a shelter, in a motel, car, or campground due to the lack of an alternate adequate uh, accommodation in a car, park, abandoned building, or bus, or train station, double up with other people due to loss of housing or economic hardship. Your school age children may qualify for certain rights and protections under the Federal McKinney Vento Act, okay? Your eligible children have the right to receive free education, appropriate public education, enroll in school, uh, immediately, even if lacking document documents normally required for enrollment, enroll in school on ten classes while the school gathers needed document documents. Okay, enroll in the local school or continue attending their schools of origin. The schools they attend when permanently housed or the school in which they were last enrolled. If that is your preference and is feasible, if the school district believes that the school you select is not in the best interest of your children then the district must provide you with a written explanation 
of its position and inform you of your rights to appeal its decision. At your request, receives transportations up to one hour to and from the school of origin, receives educational services comparable to those uh, provided to other students according to your children's need. If you believe your children, uh, including preschool children, may be eligible, contact the local homeless liaison to find out what services and supports may be available. So I know that uh, there's a, a local homeless liaison assigned to the Cambridge School District, but I don't have the contact information. But uh, as soon as I do, you know, I'll share it with you. But if, uh, if you don't want to wait, you can call 781-338-370, compliance at doe.mass.eu. That's 781-338-3700, compliance at doe.mass.edu. So if you have no of any homeless children have, have experiencing difficulty uh, enrolling in school, you contact those people. And as soon as I get the, uh, the uh, representative, uh, the uh, liaison representative of the school district, I'm going to share that with you so you have that de detailed information uh, for emergencies, etc., etc. Okay, voters, uh, we're going to get back into that video pretty soon. Voters to decide Eggertown fluoride debate, okay? Despite criticism from some residents, the Eggertown, Bo Eggertown Board of Health has decided to approve a plan for adding fluoride to the town's water supply, according to the uh, uh, Vineyard Gazette. But before that happens, a vote will be taken on the proposal. A petition on the question received enough signatures to put the idea before voters at town meeting and by ballot at annual uh, town election. A member of the Board of Health says, Adding fluoride to the water is in the town's best interest because it reduces tooth decay. Opponents of the plan say some studies link fluoride to a host of uh, health issues. Many island doctors and dentists support the idea. Members of the Board of Health says they look forward to town meeting, and that's April. Now, this is one town uh, called Edwardstown, Mass., and they want to add fluoride. It's poison, toxic. Uh, chemical to the water water supply, fresh water supply. But uh, the uh, fluoride alert uh, dot org people, they're opposed to adding fluoride or any other toxic element to the water supply. They want to keep it fresh and clean. So we, we're going to get back to that video right now, I believe. Those response here, the benchmark dose could also be used on, on this data set. Uh, the background for this, this work was, as Paul mentioned earlier, the meta-analysis published by Choi et al. in 2012. That's when we started on this paper, 2012. Um, in that particular study, uh, there were uh, uh, um, uh, 26 of the um, studies showed a, a, an average IQ point loss of seven between children who were exposed to high levels versus kids who exposed at low levels. Ten of those high levels of drinking water were three milligrams per liter or less. And the highest high level, if you will, was 8.3 milligrams um, of fluoride per liter. And we took these to be virtual lowest observed effect concentrations, if you will, or lead, which would lead us to virtual lowest observed adverse effect levels once we factor in some other fluoride exposures that took place. Uh, another complete other set of data did show dose response, and those uh, um, uh, those studies were conducted by the Shang a group in China, who's also um, uh, Guanyong Shang is a co-author on this paper, and um, his work allowed us to calculate total fluoride dose because he measured the water intake, he measured fluoride intake from food and other sources, and we were able to combine the um, amount of fluoride from water with the amount of fluoride from food, which was the predominant other source, to get a total fluoride dose. As Paul pointed out, it's the dose and not the concentration in water that counts. <clears throat> the, uh, and we used the Lowell Noel method uh, for the uh, uh, Choi data set, where we had 10 uh, examples of high dose uh, showing 3 milligrams Okay, that was uh, uh, Bill Hersey, and the title, title of that video was Flor Fluoridation Risk to the Brain, 
Okay, so if you'd like to see the whole video, you can contact FloridaAlert.org, and I think it's there. It's available for you. But uh, we must get all of these toxic poison taken out of the water supply or prevent them from being added to the water supply. You know, uh, the city council in Cambridge, uh, they were working on it. They were discussing it. <laughs> they had a conversation about uh, the clean, clean and fresh water for the people, for the population. But uh, uh, if you'd like to uh, <laughs> do something to have this issue addressed, you can contact your local elected official and tell them to get to work on cleaning up the fresh water. There's a lot of toxic uh, elements in the Cambridge water supply, believe it or not. But they're not telling you about it. They try to reduce the amounts, but the poison is still there. They just need to get all that toxic poison out of the water supply. You know, I've got something here. I'm going to take a turn to, in a different direction right now. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the uh, Haitian American United Incorporated, that's HAU and its partners, they want you to help them establish in Boston, Massachusetts, a, a <laughs> okay, that's a... Um, a Haitian Cultural Center, okay, yeah, entitled Toussaint Louverture Cultural Center. Now, Toussaint Louverture was the man who was the head of the uh, the uh, freedom movement to to uh, liberate uh, Haiti from France. So the Boston uh, uh, Haitian American United they want to establish a Toussaint Louverture uh, Cultural Center, and I think this is uh, they want this to be done in. Uh, Mattapan, anyway, uh, to promote and preserve the rich and vibrant uh, heritage, uh, Haitian heritage and culture, featuring a library focused on Haitian literature, music, and art, a function hall for educational and cultural events, senior and youth programming activities, room for community meetings, lectures, series, workshops, adults and youth classes on Haitian history, language and arts uh, office for community information and referrals. So, for more information and to contribute to the project, you can contact the Haitian American United Incorporated. That's uh, P.O. Box 260440, Mattapan, in Massachusetts, 02129. Or you can call them to uh, get some additional information, okay, if you don't want to uh, wait for uh, <laughs> a return on your letters submissions. You can call 617-417-8421 or 617-298-2979, or you can email uh, unity at hauinc.org. Email, once again, that's a unity at hauinc.org. So, uh, the Tucson Lowature Cultural Center, and that's what the, the Haitian American United Incorporated, that's that's the project that they want to build in Mattapan. So, you uh, get uh, get your folks ready to help our Haitian brothers and sisters uh, bring this cultural center into existence and make it a reality. Another thing about, since we're talking about Haitians, uh, there's the uh, Haitian in Context. It's uh, it's an art exhibition, and uh, it's daily, daily at the uh, Sherrill Library, Leslie University. That's uh, that's 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 uh, that's about that's on uh, Brattle Street. That's that's a uh, I think it's a 99 Brattle Street, but anyway, there's uh, an exhibition, and it's uh, in the Sherrill Library Atrium through January 20, 2018, since we're talking about Haitians, and that's at the Leslie, uh, hashtag Leslie University, hashtag Art Text Exhibition, so that's, uh, uh, okay, that's a Haitian exhibition, and it's going to be uh, in the uh, uh, Sherrill Library Atrium throughout uh, throughout uh, January 2018. Okay, I'm Hassan Rashid. You know, it's always excellent being here with you and it's such a great achievement to come into your lives like we do here at uh, CCTV Daily. Okay, if I have anything else to share with you, I do, but, uh, you know, I, <laughs> time won't permit me to go any further with this news and information, human services news and information on uh, this episode, but eventually we're going to try to uh, to uh, return to some of the things that you've been hearing me uh, 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 share with you at this program. Sharing is caring. Okay, uh, one more thing. I'd like to remind you that uh, if you'd like to know what's going on here at CCTV uh, for the rest of, uh, since uh, December is just right here in the corner, for the month of December, you come on in and check out Open Studios. You might find out up front 
or you have to come come in the door and uh, to where at 438 Massachusetts and you can get this open studio to tell you everything that's happening here at CCTV so if you don't want to wait and uh, you want to find out what's going on I'm gonna share uh, there's a, a number you can call you can call and get uh, get up get up get a heads up or low down on everything that's happening here at CCTV okay so the number to call is a 617-661-6900 and or you can email w uh, uh excuse me you can go to the website that's www.cctvcambridge.org and inquire about anything that's uh happening on uh, channel eight channel nine and channel 96 i'm rasha she hassan rashid and you know always I remind you to to keep your nose clean play straight and don't forget to assist someone in need of your help so until next time i leave you once again uh with the uh cordial of peace that's peace be unto you For, uh, uh, for leader of fluoride. And we used uncertainty factors for uh, converting the low L to the no L, and then for inter-individual sensitivity and in utero toxicity. Uh, <clears throat> um, in the benchmark dose method, um, I can explain a little bit more about what the benchmark, how the benchmark dose operates, but uh, there, there isn't exactly a low, a low L, but there's something like that called a benchmark, uh, an uh, upper.